Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first webinar of IT Leadership, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC for this webinar and for the duration of the course. Your mentor is the irrepressible doyen of IT management and project management courses, short and postgraduate with Charles Sturt University, Brenton Birchmore, who I'll introduce shortly. Wherever and whenever you're watching this, we hope you are safe and well and content and excited about still more content on the cheap, for you anyway. <laughs> Before we begin, some housekeeping. All webinars for this course will be held at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you, wish, if you miss one or can't make any of them, don't worry. Uh, we make recordings for those who cannot attend uh, a given webinar and you can find them on the course page later. Despite the recordings, if you can make it, please do make an attempt because if you attend the live webinars, um, it really does help contribute to a collaborative learning environment in both the chat and I guess uh, engaging in forum discussions um, that are sort of directly related to what was discussed live. We quite clearly use Zoom for our webinars and encourage the use of questions and chat throughout the course. Um, we ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions about sort of dates and resource availability, uh, any, any sort of IT issues to the support team in chat. You can chat with panellists only in the chat or to your fellow students as well. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. There are usually some very experienced attendees who are very helpful um, sort of augmenting the discussion that Brenton will be having. Um, so, so feel free to sort of post any questions in there, just little ones. Um, their insights often augment the, the content quite well. We'll have formal Q&A sessions at the end of each webinar, um, or if someone sends in a question that's particularly relevant to a, a, a slide or a concept, um, I'll interrupt Brenton and we'll probably wax lyrical for a little while after that. For those who've never taken part in a short course with us, first of all, welcome. IT Masters is a training organisation that exists as a partner to Charles Sturt University, who we work with to create and deliver a number of master's courses, or postgraduate courses, I should say, because we also do graduate certificates. We also market these courses on CSU's behalf and hope that the best way to do that is give some of it away free. If we do a good enough job and students like the courses, then hopefully they'll be encouraged to enrol in the postgraduate courses if it suits them. With that said, we want this course to be useful and a rewarding exercise uh, in its own right. We want you to you know, make use of the in interesting information Brenton has, hopefully have a bit of fun with it um, and, and maybe even make some connections with some of your um, fellow students. To date, well over 4,000 people have enrolled in the course. So there's, there's plenty of people to choose from. You can get busy here and in the forums. Hannah, as ever, is around uh, to, in an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. She's uh, also responsible for the course page, um, which is where you find all the, material, all the materials needed for this course. Links to readings and Brenton's wonderful audio um, lectures, which we're ever grateful for. Um, other tasks and discussion forums, little quizzes, that sort of stuff. If you have any questions tonight or later on about, you know, how to use the course page, um, feel free to contact us using the details there. It's time to welcome Brenton. Uh, Brenton Birchmore is a long time postgraduate course and subject author, as well as a um, postgraduate course completer with Charles Sturt University. It seems like it's fair to call him a lifetime friend of these short courses um, and a vastly experienced industry practitioner in all sorts of areas. It's a, it's a fun story that he'll no doubt um, flesh out soon. He's full of qualifications um, and certifications and awards and He's also good on the yarn. Um, I just love doing short courses with Brenton as they usually penetrate my my head with his clear communication. So please make him welcome and please say good day, Brenton. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome, thanks for the intro, Guy. Thanks for the uh, the uh, all the, the kind words you just offered. It's uh, great to be involved. I love the short courses. I think they are a lot of fun. They are an opportunity to try to compartmentalize an awful lot into a very short period of time. And that to me is the most fun aspect of what these courses really try and do. 
Uh, we are about to kick off in just a moment with all the content that we had planned to share with you tonight. I'm going to preface that by saying that we are talking about IT service management. For those of you who were involved in the IT Career Fundamentals short course that we had not too long ago, there was a topic four in that that is perhaps for some of you, you're going to see some echoes and some familiar slides, but we are going to talk about them quite differently. I know we have some students that were in that and are in this one as well, but uh, we will discuss them from a different perspective, but there will be a bit of it that'll seem a little bit familiar. But one of the things I want to talk about is what these four topics are all about. These four topics are meant to be building a complete picture for you. So the goal with these is not to give you four discrete pieces of understanding of IT leadership, but to try to weave them together, build a synergy for you all as to what all of these mean from an IT leadership perspective. So this week, we're going to talk about IT service management. And we're starting here because it's probably the most common, the most well-known, uh, the most familiar aspect of what IT typically does. We will talk next week about IT project management. And yes, we will talk about things like Scrum. We will talk a bit about things like larger scale Scrum, uh, SAFE. We'll talk about Agile in general. But we're going to talk about it from a leadership point of view. This is not really join the dots from a practitioner. How do you Scrum? This is more about what does Scrum mean to the organization? What does Scrum mean to IT leadership or non-IT leadership? We're going to then talk a bit about, in the following week, business analysis. And we'll try to build an understanding of what role business analysis has with IT in general, with the business in general. What needs does it fulfill for IT leadership? And in the last week, we'll talk about IT governance. And so we'll specify what we mean by that. We will talk about how that works, not only from a large organization perspective, but what does that mean to a small or medium organization as well? So the idea of what we're trying to achieve is once you've got all these four components, you will hopefully have a more complete picture of the ways in which IT leadership interacts with these different things and how it all looks when it all comes together. That's our goal for you with all of this. So I do encourage you all to get involved or get involved in the webinars at least or get the recordings of each of these four topics because you'll get the most value out of them once you've got all the four pieces together. We're gonna to talk about synergies, but not quite as much tonight because we're only covering one. Now the contents we're gonna cover with you today, we will look at what is uh, IT service management and well, what has it become? What is it now? What is it regarded as? And what are the forces from that that have shaped ITIL? What has ITIL become? So we're going to talk about a little bit of ITIL, not in as much detail as we might find elsewhere, but we're going to position ITIL as what does it mean for IT leadership? What job does it do? How does it affect IT in general? We will then talk a little bit more about the leadership and the strategic perspective because we're going to lead into and address some of the synergies. And these are the synergies we'll talk about with some of the other topics yet to come. And we'll come back each week and rejoin those dots and build that picture a little more each time as we go through it. So each week we will have a little more about synergies as we go. Now, first of all, before we go into that stuff, let me let those of you know who don't, some of you have been on some of my courses before. Who am I? I'm actually broadcasting from Singapore at the moment, uh, which is where I live now. Uh, sunny Singapore, where it's hot. We only have two seasons here, the hot and wet season and the wet and hot season. And hot on the equator, uh, it's a pretty comfortable weather most of the year round. Uh, I have, as Guy has mentioned, before uh, the last 10 years, I've been involved in the creation of this courseware. Prior to that, I had a lengthy career in the IT corporate world. And yes, I did have roles from everywhere from sales, sales management, operations. Uh, I was in charge of finance. I've led project management teams. And at one stage I was a technician configuring equipment. So I have done quite a few different things. And what that's given me is a multitude of perspectives. And what I'm hoping to do for you is to bring some of those different perspectives and find the connection points, the points where they merge together. I have done my own businesses. Uh, I'm into my fourth one at the moment uh, and I've, encountered a lot of students over the years, amongst all the short courses and all of the 
courses I teach six or seven or so of the full IC, uh, CSU courses each year and quite a few students along the way. Uh, 14 subjects, two of which aren't around anymore. A number of short courses, six or seven now, because we did one recently. Uh, I have a learning app uh, that uh, we might talk about a bit later. Uh, I am a believer in game-based learning because I'm also a heavy gamer. I've been a gamer for 20 years. Um, I, I've probably spent 20,000 hours in online games, which I call research. My wife calls something else. Yes, research. Yes, yes. Uh, and my 13-year-old son is trying very hard to catch up to. Wow. So, okay. Well, he's, he's working on it, put it that way. Hey, have I ever the, shouted at you about the fiction writing? What is that new? Have you no, always put that in the new. slides? Have you always put that in the slides? I've not always put that in the slides, mm. but I, I've been doing fiction writing for 10 years. I, I do script writing. Cool. Uh, no, and I'll I, bother you about I, that I'm later. To, I've, done, I've done seven of them now. Awesome. These are the subjects that I've authored, and I'm highlighting here for you the ones that we're going to cover over the next few weeks. So these are the subjects where... I've authored and teach these subjects and we're pulling what's hopefully some of the best and most interesting bits out of these subjects and the pre-recorded audio that you're going to be listening to is plucked directly out of those subjects. Uh, so you, you even, my intro is as the lecture number that it was in the course. So these are the ones we're going to be covering and that's obviously not in the right order because we're starting here uh, with what would be MG515. No, we're not going to cover ISO 20,000. That's kind of a heavy end. We're just going to talk about ITIL. Uh, but these are the other subjects that I've developed for IT Masters and CSU uh, over the last decade or so. Let's start with the definition. This is meant to try and get a, a starting point on what we're talking about with IT services. We're talking about IT service management. What's an IT service? And there's a lot to unpack in this statement because there's a couple of key words that I want us to remember. This talks about the use and leverage. And this word leverage is really the king of this sentence. It's the thing that we want to try and keep aware of because when we talk about an IT service, it's not the delivery of the service. It's not just the use of it. It's the leverage where it gets converted into some other outcome. It's the subsequent outcomes of IT services that gives IT services their value. It's what justifies their expense. And if we accept that statement and if we accept everything that that means, then that's gonna have some pressure on the way in which IT services have evolved over the last several years. Uh, it's the leverage of information technology by people and processes. And again, when we come to the word people, this is a kind of an obvious statement, but there's a little more meaning to it than that, that we're going to tease out from what we talk about with ITIL in particular over the next short while. So that's the definition we're working with. Keep that in mind as we go through it. When we talk well, about leverage, uh, sorry, go. So, sorry, Ben, sorry, just go. wondering, uh, we have a poll about people's, um, I guess, familiarity oh, and, and role. Um, would that be a good poll. time to use it when, when sort of thinking about the definition? Let's do that now. Okay. Let's do the poll. The, the, the poll is uh, hopefully to give you guys an idea, and we'll share it, to give you an idea where you see yourself in relation to IT service management. And also to give me an idea so that I understand my audience, you guys, tonight a little better. Yeah, sorry if you wanted it at a different time, Brendan. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I uh, was, I, I'd forgotten about it. It was oh, probably good. meant to have been a moment ago. This is okay, perfect. Excellent. Well, good. Well, we've got what would best describe your role relating to IT services, a customer, consumer, or user of IT services, a leader of a team, which is a customer of IT services, a contributor to the provision or support of IT services within IT, a leader of a team who provides IT services, I am or have been all of the above at some point, or something not captured by the above. And I put somehow in there uh, because I assume you, if, you, if you're just here, you're probably part of it. And we've got now 600 people attending. Uh, so, wow, fantastic audience. Tonight. Yeah, and we've got uh, mo most of those people have voted and we've got a large proportion sort of the, the last few answers, 30%, 25%, 25% to contributors, leaders of teams, or have been all of the above at some point. I'll end the poll and share it on your screens. 
So heavily weighted towards provision of IT services mm. uh, and uh, quite a few people that have done quite a bit of it. Have done yeah, all of great. it. Really interesting. So, so that's excellent. All right. So we, we've got an audience tonight that's got likely to have a fairly well-rounded view mm. of all the things that IT have been to them. And so I'm expecting hopefully a lot of what we're going to cover will be familiar, will resonate with a lot of this audience. But for a few people, there'll also be some new ideas and perhaps even some challenging ideas that might be different to what they've experienced in IT service management or IT service delivery mm. in the past. Great. All right. Thank you for that guy. Thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, okay, I'm going to just close that window. So let's go further into our topic about what gives us leverage. And this is part of the paradigm shift that has occurred in IT service management. The idea of value has changed. I wouldn't say just recently. I'd say it's been changing over a number of decades. But this is the way IT uh, IT services are talking about value today. It's the ultimate goal. It's what IT service delivery is here to achieve. And it always was, but it wasn't always quite so honest about that. And when we weren't always quite so direct about saying, yes, that the services deliver value and we need to focus on the value, when we were more focused on the technology, something often fell through the cracks. And What's happening now is that a lot of organizations are much better at catching what falls through the cracks. So those that still do, they struggle for competitive advantage, they struggle for efficiency, they struggle for optimization, they struggle in their various marketplaces. So it's no longer a way of saying, well, we got great IT that does great things for us and we can leverage it, so we're ahead of everyone. It's more a case of if we're not, we might be falling behind. Obviously, it depends on the industry. A few other key points that have changed with value is that well, if you have value, it's about the result after the IT service, not during or directly because of, but the subsequent things that happen later. And it's only the customer who's in that space that can really make the judgment of what is the value. Are we leveraging it? Is it being converted? So they're the arbiter of that decision, that question. But this means that they have a role to play in shaping what value they need. What leverage do they need to get out of IT services? And therefore, what do they need to contribute, think about, do, participate in, in order to shape IT services? That's the co-created component. That's the paradigm that says, well, it's not just a one-way service stream. It's about saying, well, let's get the feedback. Let's get the input. Let's have a cyclic flow of information. Not only that, we have a lot more IT services now than we ever had before. There's a, a many different ways that IT can be leveraged. And what we're also seeing is more and more specialization in IT services, compartmentalized, which means the synergy of multiple services working together is more important than it ever was. Simultaneously, we're seeing a lot of technologies become easier, becoming more ubiquitous, uh, becoming more self-managed, or at least from the user's point of view. Some of the mystery of things is disappearing under the hood. So the synergies, on, on the one hand, they look easier to the user, but that's deceptive. There's actually more complexity going on behind the scenes to make those synergies work. And of course, we have the innovation. It's all changing quite rapidly and it'll all be different in the near future. So these are the ideas that are shaping the way IT service management is heading or where it's going right now. So yes, it is all about value. And I'm positioning value to you here as three different types of value or three different grades of value. So we think of discrete value. This is something that IT delivery, IT service delivery was always good at. We had a service, it did something. And that was what we would describe as discrete value. It didn't really necessarily work with other services. It did a thing and that was good enough. When we have synergistic value, we have value where multiple services have to actually work together and in some coordinated fashion in order to deliver a higher degree of value. There's a leverage value, not just from leveraging a service, 
but from leveraging services that leverage each other. A simplest example would be bandwidth, just networking access. You can have great apps on your phone, but if you don't have fast enough access for your mobile device, you're not gonna get the benefit out of those great apps. So the push towards 5G is all about synergistic value. But there's a step above that, that it's a little more new, and that's the co-created, which we just mentioned a moment ago. So co-created value is where the stakeholders have a say, a proactive say, a deliberate say. And a lot of that element, when we talk about co-created value, that's going to be a theme that will resonate through the next three weeks as well. Because that's one of the pillars of the new IT paradigm that IT leadership is stuck with. We have to deal with these forces, these influences, these factors. And it's how we deal with that that's going to make a lot of difference as to how successful our IT really is. Another way of looking at this, perhaps a little tongue in cheek, is to say, well, discrete value is something you just deliver to your customers. Synergistic value is when we listen to our customers. We say, oh, well, that's not good enough. That's, that's not enough. You want that and that. And when it works together, it's even better. Glad we asked. But then you have working with your customers where we engage them on a level that says, well, we know we're delivering this, this, and this. But what else can we do? What would add to that? What else would you like? And there's a trap with that because often they don't know. They don't know what the tech could do. They know a lot about what they could do, but there needs to be a meeting of the middle where we reach out and pull them into that conversation. When we start to talk about services, we are talking about not products anymore. The paradigm of, you know, a product, an IT product is, or a singular discrete service, that's the discrete value. Those, that era has largely moved on for most industries. It's not about the technology. It's not the product that comes from that technology. It's not really even the service of that technology. When we go all the way to what ITIL4 is talking about, it's what that service can do for the customer. And that's the final frontier. That's the huge leap. We got through these steps with our IT savvy. You know, we, we took it all the way to here's a service and we were good at that. Here, we no longer just have to know about everything we do, we have to know what the customer does. And then the customer needs to combine those with all of the other things that they do in order to produce their outcome and their results. And this is when you get into the land of solutions. So the solution, is a collection of services that will yield something big in terms of value for the users, the customers, the recipient. Now, when I'm talking about customers, I could be talking about other departments in our organization, other teams, non-IT, or even IT. We are our own customer from an IT perspective. But the typical sales team, the finance team, the operations team, the logistics team, Whatever other teams or departments we have, they're all typically customers of the IT service delivery. So ITIL is trying to fill this gap. Now, when you look at ITIL 4, and it's not widely adopted yet, it's not vastly different from ITIL 3, but it has added a few specific things that are right in this area that we're talking about. And this area that we're talking about has the most significant impact on leadership. So the changes in ITIL, the evolution of ITIL, which has come from an understanding of the industry evolution of IT service management, that's not really a big evolution of what the average technician will do. But it's a huge evolution of what IT leadership needs to do. And that's what this is all about tonight. Understanding what that difference is and why it's so important for IT leadership to get our head around what these changes are. Now, ITIL, it's a framework, it's a set of guidelines, it's guidance on how to go about many of the things that IT service management requires us to do. It doesn't give you all the answers, but it does try to help you know what the questions should be so that you've asked them and you've got some answers out of it. Uh, it's quite old now. I mean, it started back in the 80s. It started in the UK. It started as a way of the UK government getting all of their suppliers, because back then, IT suppliers was popping up everywhere 
And this was a way for the UK government to say, look, let's have a way for them to all work so we can all talk the same language and we can all understand what we're getting from our IT providers. It's evolved a lot since then. It started very technical. And the most philosophical leap that it has undertaken has been from ITIL 3 to ITIL 4. Many organizations that deliver IT services or departments will use ITIL. And if they don't use ITIL as a, as a proclaimed framework, what they will be doing and the most common sense things that they've decided works for them will bear a lot of resemblance to what ITIL does and has. We've talked about this. I sneak peeked that for you earlier. What is an IT service? Why are we talking about ITIL? It is the most widely used of the IT service delivery practices. Where does it sit? Here, it's a framework. Guidelines to help to avoid failure, but won't tell you how to join the dots and won't tell you everything. I've put in here a few other things in red that we're gonna to touch on in subsequent weeks. And that's why they stand out a little bit. So when we're gonna talk a little bit about Scrum, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, business analysis, which is what the BABOC is all about. We're gonna talk about COVID, which is governance, but we're gonna talk about the methodology aspects of those. We will cover Agile when we talk about project management next week. Uh, this is sort of telling you where these things fit with each other. So here's what you get in ITIL. We are not going to explore all of this just now. Uh, that's far, far too big. There's an entire subject that we cover this. 60% uh, of the subject is just this. So we're going to talk about these things briefly. We're going to cover what the key concepts are and the four dimensions, because that's where leadership has its biggest changes in how we need to think about IT service delivery. When you look at the service value system, which we'll briefly touch on, the management practices, they're not too different. They have evolved a little bit, but that's where you get the most detailed guidance of what you're going to do. We're not gonna be covering that because that's a level of detail that is below what we need to talk about with leadership. So the key concepts, some of these are very leadership oriented. And you look at, we go through these uh, step by step because these are the things that most significantly concern the decision-making. And when I talk about IT leadership, let's pause for a second and clarify what I'm referring to with that. I'm referring to the decision makers. And I'm not just talking about the person who runs IT. I'm talking about those who influence that person, those who sit on committees, those who, are involved in workshops, those who are involved in contributing to decision-making, those who have expertise or knowledge or experience, familiarity with how things work. They are all part of IT leadership. They may not all carry a degree of responsibility and accountability. That will be clearly defined in the hierarchy, but everyone has a role to play in helping ensure the delivery of value that IT services are meant to deliver to be leveraged. So one of the key concepts that ITIL tells us is we need to be, as an organization, as an IT organization, we need to create value for its stakeholders. That's what we do. We don't deliver IT services. We don't do tech. That's, that's secondary. Okay, that's a stretch. It's not secondary. It's primary. It is what we do. It's why we do it. We do it for the outcomes. Another key concept is the who, the organization, the structure, the stakeholders themselves. Who has what responsibility? When you're talking about responsibility for value, the structure can change. I was involved in a project about two and a half years ago with an organization that needed to re-examine their help desk. Now we've all got a, a, a typical picture of help desk where you have your know, level one, level two, level three. And typically, and for them, it was that as you went deeper into the levels, you reached a greater level of technical specific expertise in whatever technology it was. And that's how they divided their training and their expertise. And they had a success rate of incidents being resolved at level one of about 30%. Many things got escalated to level two and level three often needed to go up the chain. What they did is they restructured level one entirely. And instead of training level one on particular bits of technology, they trained level one 
on what the other departments in the company did. What that meant was that the sales team had a couple of dedicated level one support people that knew all the stuff that happened in sales, how they used all of the technology. And another part of the level one team knew all about what the operations division did. And yes, there was overlaps, but they brought that structure into their organization of level one. What that meant is that their level one tech support had a huge boost in their contextual understanding of what an incident really was, of what their users were trying to do, the leverage they were trying to gain, and were able to at least resolve or articulate to level two far more correctly what the problem was and what was needed. So resolution of incidents to level one went from 30% to 55%. And level two, which was another 30%, also went up. So level three had half as many incidents to handle after this change. That was just an organizational change that reorganized based on value delivery and leverage, not based on technology and provisioning and supply. A key concept that I talked about, products and services. Uh, products are merely resources that do something. It's a, you configure a resource, you call it a product. It's nomenclature, it's categorization. But the services are the way in which those products achieve outcomes. The fourth key concept in ITIL is service relationships. Now, it's probably not common in a lot of organizations that you say that from an IT perspective, the relationships we have is one of the top four things we think about on a daily basis. Some do, but not all. And historically, not many. It is a relatively new phenomenon. So I'll go one further. I'll put them all up. We'll talk about what leadership needs to deal with with all of this, where leadership fits. Leadership is responsible for value because leadership has the greatest responsibility for the decisions that lead to the creation of value. We talked about an example a moment ago where level one non-leadership roles got involved in the creation of value, but that happened because leadership did an organizational restructure. Why? Because they were responsible for value co-creation. So leadership needs to know who the stakeholders are. You need to know very clearly who are your customers, who are the stakeholders in those customer organizations. We need to know what our services are, but more importantly, we need to know what the relationships are. So leadership is responsible for the relationships. Now, admittedly, in those situations, what increased, that example I gave you, what increased was level one technicians started to develop relationships with individuals or, and with departments through that affinity, through that frequent contact. Were they responsible for those relationships? No. The leadership in level one was responsible for ensuring that those happened, which meant that as those relationships grew, the customers began to depend upon them. And they didn't want to talk to some other level one that was looking after some other department. They wanted their per person or, or people. And so that was a problem that had to be solved by having some crossover because you had to deal with absentees, et cetera. But one of the biggest down the bottom is when you look at value, if you're responsible for value, then you're responsible for what might damage that value, which means as a leader, you're responsible for the risks. And when it comes to IT service delivery risks, the big risks is what does it mean to the customer? What, what can't they do anymore because this technology isn't working right? And that's a huge shift. I mean, it was more than a dozen years ago, uh, 12, 15 years ago, I was working for an organization. I was operations director and we were delivering B2B VPN services, networking, telephony, organizational communications. At that time, it was novel, it was new to be positioning risk from the customer's point of view. A lot of organizations were saying, well, what's the risk to us? The risk is customer dissatisfaction. The customer's rebates because the SLA wasn't met. So we've got to give away some money. The risk is, well, that particular customer had a totally different consequence. Let's cover the four dimensions because then we can talk a little bit more about the leadership stuff. 
Guy, are we getting uh, some interesting questions that we need to pause for, or do you think we should push uh, on a little bit further? I'm trying to get with the uh, – we'll keep a, a few for the end and just trying to get to a few of the more fact-based ones now. I think okay. we'll keep going. All right. Questions like how can we measure value are probably a long-form discussion later. Okay, yeah. All right, well, we can cover that uh, uh, closer to the end. All right, so that's the key concepts. Let's go back. These are the key concepts. This is one half of ITIL that I wanted to share with you because it's half of the bit that really matters to leadership. This is the other half that really matters. And these are there's four dimensions. I've broken them down a little more specifically. The first is the dimension of organizations and people. Now we think of a dimension, what we're really thinking about from a leadership point of view is a category of decisions. You can think of it in those terms. It's, it's a category of decision-making that we need to go through. And if you're a senior IT leader, then you are needing to be responsible for which other leaders, when you say leaders, thought leaders, contributors, expertise, do you need to bring into the discussions and the decisions relating to IT management? This is the point where this gets worked out. And this is where you have, we've all heard the direct line, dotted line in a broader ubiquitous sense. It takes on new meaning in IT leadership because what you have is you have lines of reporting and then you have lines of influence. And the lines of influence are influence towards decisions. And that's where you have advisory committees. That's where you have um, interactions between people who you know bring unique bits of understanding and knowledge into a decision making that needs to happen. So if you need that level of communication, if you need people to communicate across hierarchical boundaries, you need to be carefully organized. You need to be carefully facilitated. How does that interaction take place? How does that meeting take place? Who chairs that? Is it the boss that chairs that meeting? Maybe not, probably not, because you don't want a hierarchical framework in that engagement. The second dimension, information and technology. Let me draw your attention to the ampersand that lives here. This is not IT, the way we think of it as a single phrase, information technology, it's information and technology. What ITIL4 is saying to us here, we gotta separate these two. What this means to leadership is that we as leadership are responsible for the information. That's our domain. That's what matters most to us. The technology will happen. We, we have, there's lots of experts looking after that. Uh, there's people that look after the things with the flashing lights or the software or whatever it is, and they have an important role to play, but it's the information that makes that valuable. That's what makes it leverageable. A great piece of technology with garbage information in it is going to produce poor result. And we know that, we know, we all know that through experience, but what ITIL4 and what the modern paradigm of IT service management is expecting of us is that that's the bit that we can't drop the ball. We can have old tech, we can have poor tech, we can have cheap technology, as long as the information it's working with is top shelf, then we'll get more value out of it. Third dimension, partners and suppliers. Most IT service delivery does not operate entirely self-contained, more so than ever before. You just gotta look at the, you know, everything as a service, the cloud phenomenon, and really you can get pretty much everything as a service. So that means a lot of the things that we used to have running on a box in a room where we had the key, now it's not. It's something somewhere else and we don't know quite always where it is, well, we think we do. Uh, and yes, we have a portal to access it, but a lot of the things have disappeared from our view and we feel they've disappeared from our control. So one of the dimensions of decision-making that leadership needs to take responsibility for is how is that structured amongst all of the entities that supply to us? It is absolutely no longer acceptable to blame a supplier for anything, even when it's their fault. Because this brings up the paradigm that yeah, it might be their fault, but it's our problem. If we are IT leadership, 
we are responsible for the value that our customers enjoy or are currently not enjoying, as the case may be. And the fact that it might be caused by a supplier is not something the customer is likely or should care about. The fourth dimension is value streams and processes. There's values come back again. Here it is again, value streams. Now, one of the ideas that we've had to get our head around in IT service delivery is that value is not static. Value evolves. And ever since the creation and the involvement of Agile in delivery of IT, we've said, okay, let's have an adaptive approach. Let's have an iterative approach. But formalizing that on a broader scale, you know, we, we can scrum a project. You know, that's okay. We, we kind of know how to do that now. But how do, we, how do we do that to the entire IT department? That's what value streams do. And value streams are entirely the responsibility of IT leadership because that's the highest piece of the pyramid that delivers the value and needs to evolve. It's a stream because it's always moving. It's always in motion. It's always evolving the way in which it delivers value. So this is what ITIL, ITIL 4, is presenting and positioning as its most iconic, most important new developments for IT service management. I'm gonna put up here a snapshot of the guiding principles of the service value system, but we're only gonna talk about three of them, the ones that really matter to leadership. These are the guiding principles that ITIL tell us are part of the SVS. And what's the SVS? That is the everything that manages our IT services. So this, the service value system is all the things that we have in place that allow us to deliver IT services. And it's interesting that they keep throwing this word value in there. It just keeps putting it under our nose. We can't miss it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull all these up. Here they are. We don't need to go through all of these for our purposes tonight. A couple of them we will, and I'll let your eyes wander about some of the others uh, to get familiar with them if you aren't already aware of them. One of the first, you've probably already spotted it. You probably already know that that's where I'm going to go with this point in the conversation. Focus on value. At the end results, and only the customer can really decide what the end results are. That is the key goal of the service value system, i.e. the everything that we have, everything that exists under ITIL in our IT service management exists for that focus. Couldn't be more blunt. But we've already talked about that. A second point, progress iter iteratively with feedback. This is about the communications flow. We need to get the feedback. In order to get the feedback, we need to know who to get the feedback from. We need to, at times, help those individuals understand enough about the technology. The example I gave you before about changes that an organization made to their help desk, they did the reverse as well. As part of this, they got each department to have technology champions within the other teams. And what those individuals were responsible for doing is upskilling their knowledge and understanding of what the technology does for their department. So they were part of the bridge that gets created between that department and the IT department. And so they became responsible for the collecting, organizing, structuring, and provisioning of the feedback that IT services need. So imagine this, you've got an IT service department, previously a little bit old fashioned, who evolved to say, we're gonna have subject matter experts and their subject matter experts is our customers departments. And in those departments, they're gonna have technology experts that are experts on what exactly? The technology that that department uses. We now have a pretty solid line of not only communication, but understanding between us as an IT department and the other departments who are utterly dependent upon what we do in order to get value out of the services. So this point feeds back into what leadership needs to be able to solve to say, well, 
That might not be your method, the example I gave you, but there needs to be decisions made by leadership to answer this question. How are we going to get feedback? From who? How are we going to make that feedback valuable? How are we going to make it timely? Because it's got to be iteratively. If we're evolving an IT service, creating an IT service, doing something, spending money on something, we want to be able to get feedback each step of the way. The third point, I'm sure many of you have already spotted this already because it's in the same vein. Avoid silo mentality, think holistically. When I say think holistically, I, it's, it, this is not a halfway measure. What this is telling us is think of the company, think of the business, think of the organization, think of the enterprise. And if that's not far enough, think of the shareholders. Well, we, we think of the board as well, but no, the shareholders, you know, they deserve more sympathy. So we'll think of the shareholders. We'll think of the ones whose equity is tied up in this, which could be ours. We could be shareholders ourselves. So this is the impact that the changes of IT services is having on the way in which leadership needs to think about what they do each day in an IT environment. Now, the management practices, I'm merely going to mention that they're there. We're not going to go into them in detail because that's going to take a little bit too long. There are a bunch of general management practices. There's guidance on what you need to do to be an efficient functioning IT department. There's service management practices on how you manage your services, and there's some technical management practices. Those of you who are familiar with ITIL will know that ITIL's always had that, and they're still there. But yeah, they've restructured a little bit, but that's not the breaking news. The breaking news is the stuff that we've already covered. So I've talked a lot about leadership. I've talked about how it makes decisions. Well, let's contrast that for a second with management because we often use the words interchangeably. I'm not always using the words interchangeably. Management makes decisions. Management makes decisions about resources. Leadership does a little differently. Leadership ensures that the decisions get made, if not by them, then by someone else, by the right people at the right time. Because you need all of that to happen and it all needs to be right to deliver value, to be able to leverage what we do. This is a slightly more old fashioned view or rather the thought that this is adequate is the old fashioned view. Not a lot of organizations still think this way, but not every organization has figured out how to make this work. Try and draw it into a single sentence. Wow, that's yeah, we, we, we aim for that. We, we don't shy away from the tough asks around here. That's what this sentence is trying to do. All the things we've just talked about, bring it down to boil it down to a single sentence. IT leadership brings context to the delivery of IT services. It owns the context. And that example I gave you about the restructuring of responsibilities and skills and knowledge, relationships and interactions, that was all contextual. It was not to do with the tech. It was not to do with discrete. It was to do with holistic. It was to do with outcome. It was to do with leverage. And it's all about thinking contextually. The contextual question is not what does it do? It's what does that mean? What does it relate to? Why does it matter? Matters to whom? Matters for what? That's the question that modern IT leadership needs to wrestle with on a daily basis. So a few takeaway summary points. We'll have some time for questions in a moment. IT SM leadership. Delivers services, does not deliver IT. It's the services that deliver the outcomes. The tech is incidental and often invisible these days. So IT leadership needs to think about delivering service, services and service. IT leadership breaks the ice between us and everyone else. This is a huge responsibility that IT leadership needs to take on. And this is going to be, like some, of you will, some of you will be thinking, hang on, I'm not sure I agree with you on that point, Brenton. Uh, well, 
let me explain for just a second. If we assume or accept that there has to be greater dialogue between IT leadership and let's call them non-IT leadership, who should take responsibility for that? Who should initiate that? Now, historically, a lot of perspectives have been, well, it's, you know, it's, it's them. They're, they're the ones that really, they're the ones that suffer. They have the biggest impact. They're the ones who, who really need us, right? We're IT. They need us. They, they should be talking to us. The problem with that is that they have further to go. Intellectually, contextually, comprehensively, they have further to go. Because the average IT person, the average IT leader is required in the making of their daily, weekly, monthly decisions. Those decisions inherently require them to know more about the other departments and what goes on in those departments than those departments need to know about IT. You think about all the daily, weekly, monthly decisions that the non-IT leaders have to make. They don't need to know as much about IT for their decisions as we need to know for our decisions about them. So inherently, we already know more than them. We have already gone further across that bridge. Of course, it's us that has to break the ice. Of course, it's us that has to take responsibility for the success of what that bridge can accomplish. So we're the ones that says, I want to have a meeting, I want to facilitate, get some stakeholders together, get your experts in a room. We want to have a workshop. We want your feedback. We want to, this is the things we need to cover. This is what we think you need to know about the tech. This is this new thing that's just come out that we know we think it might be able to help you guys a little more. And look, I know it's all gobbledygook to you, but that's what we're going to help you through that. That's what IT leadership is required to initiate. Because we take responsibility for value. And we can never shirk that. That, that. For the same reasons I just mentioned about having to break the ice, we can't shirk the responsibility for value. We cannot delegate that across the aisle because, well, we could, but the entity, the organization will get a lesser result on average. That's what the lessons of the modern era are telling us. It's going to be more effective if we do it. IT leadership knows more about you than you know about them, or often IT leadership knows more about the other departments than you might know about the other departments. When I say you, I'm positioning non-IT leadership. I'll give you an example. IT leadership will know more about what happens in sales than operations will know happens in sales. Perhaps. That's exaggeration. That's a broad generalization. But this can be a a clear advantage and a clear important paradigm for a lot of organizations. Yeah, of course, sales and ops will know a lot about bits and pieces. But when it comes to the technology, nobody will know more about how that is meant to work or should know more than IT leadership. And of course, it's not about today. It's not about what we're doing today. We have to know how everything is being used and leveraged so that we can know how it can be leveraged better. So, if we want to get funding for the new gadgets and new widgets and new things that are great, we need to help people understand how it's going to help them, what we can do next. So the synergies, this is a little tricky because we're going to talk about three topics we haven't covered yet, right? IT service management and IT project management. This is some of the obvious ones. We'll come back to these each week. This section will get a little bit bigger each week. IT project management, is the, is the processes that create, build everything that IT service management has to work with. All that stuff, all that tech, it usually came about through some sort of project management. There's an irreversible relationship between the two. If we want the right tech, if we want the right projects done, and if we want the projects delivered, not just on time and on target and under budget, but with the right value outcomes, then that's where business analysis comes in. Everything that IT service management does today exists because somebody somewhere, somewhen said that they needed it. Somebody made a decision that said, this is our requirement. We, we have this requirement. And hopefully, ideally, very clever people used some very clever processes to make sure that that was the right answer to that question. 
And so what you've got is exactly what you needed. And then of course, there's the making sure. Making sure of what? Well, in simple terms, making sure that all this stuff that we do, yeah, it might be great because it's meeting all the needs of all of our other customers and other departments and ourselves, and it's all interesting, but is that actually achieving the company's strategy? Is that actually doing what the board signed off to the shareholders that would what's, what would happen to their money? That's the role of governance. Well, it's part of the role of governance. And we'll complete that circle as we go when we get there. So let me pause there. Let me see how we're going with questions, Guy. Well, uh, we now have many questions, many, many ah. questions. We, we paused and reminded people that there was a question and answer box, I think. Yeah, and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> uh rightio so shall we just jump into them or have some final thoughts first or um no let's jump into them eh? all right all right um let's start with othman who has an interesting proposition for you that i'd like you to evaluate there is a fifth dimension that i tell forgets uh, the human dimension in terms of diversity, culture, resistance to change, and the way we provide service and evaluate its value. I would agree with that. Uh, I, I think that ITIL tries to cover it with the dimension of organizations and people. I, I think they try to spread their wings over that a little bit. But I think one of the areas that perhaps does a better job and maybe maybe you could argue it belongs there or not, but governance actually has more to say about that because the consequences of that not working out go usually beyond the consequences of service delivery and beyond the consequences of service value. They usually extend outside of that. And so, and they're usually not IT specific. They're, they're usually, the, the, the good and the bad is usually broader and beyond that. And so in my experience, you will find perhaps some answers to that will come from the governance decisions that get made. And I'm not just saying, look, you need a governance framework to solve that. No, I'm saying that well, you need some decisions made from, you need some governance questions asked and some answers given. And that is a, an extra uh, arrow in your quiver to deal with exactly that point. But I would agree that uh, ITIL is a bit light on answering that question. Uh, it's still it's still a stepping stone from where it was from a very technical perspective and i don't think it's quite that holistic yet and it's a good point that that he's made or, or he or she has made that it's something we need to keep in mind yeah thanks um there was a question about that often an anonymous attendee uh probably a bit related to governance uh, on the pre on the previous slide we're talking about slide 11 now um uh, we're talking about uh, strategy, the, your, your sort of framework, methodology, standard approach, strategy slide. Slide 11, da, 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 this one, no? Yeah, maybe 12, sorry. This one. Yeah, that's the one. Anonymous yeah. attendee asks um, about this slide, shouldn't there be reference to policy and how that fits into the model? Is, is policy about uh, governance, would you include policy inside that to, to account for the things that Othman was talking about? So I, I would generally, and it's, it's a loose association, but I would put policy under the approach. Policies, it, yeah, policy can apply anywhere, to, to be honest. You, you, you can have policy that either impacts any of this layer, uh, these layers, or comes from these layers. But you'll find the, in my experience, the highest quantity or the, the biggest influence from policy is in the approach. How are we going to go about it? What's our policy when this happens? And that's the approach question. Uh, uh, how are we going to go about it? And policy is not process. It's not like this is how you do it. Here's the join the dots. Policy is guidance for when the decisions need to be made. They have a policy on this is how we kind of do this. And within that, you've got to find your way with the details. But that's why I think uh, you, you look at these things and they don't really go specifically in this. But Everything here, COBIT, uh, Baybok in particular, uh, ITIL, they will have elements in them that are asking the approach question. 
how are we going to approach this? And I think you're also right about mentioning governance because governance is very strong on what's our approach because the approach, which is what leads to policies, are meant to be the things when you don't have a process, you don't have a procedure, you don't have that detail answered yet. What are you going to fall back on? Is you're going to fall back on policy if you have one or even broader than that, what's your general approach to this? The highest level guidance you can find to working towards an answer. And I think if you go back to the points that I was making about value co-creation and what I was alluding to that I felt that IT leadership is now asked to deal with, that's an approach. That's a, it's almost a philosophy mm. and you could line them up in that way. Super interesting. Um, yeah, there's honestly, there's so many questions. I'm just trying to find ones that, that sort of match up. But um, I guess let's go with a huge one. Don has asked, how can we measure value? Um, and I wonder whether that's also related to the, the questions we've just answered. Powerful question. Uh, I'm going to try not to give a cheeky answer. And I'm going to say iteratively, not absolutely. And... Mm. I wonder if part of the point behind that question is that if we continue to pursue absolute answers, uh, we will always struggle. And I, I believe that's part of the evolution of what's happening. Uh, a value can only be super important if we're a little bit gentle with it. And if we are looking for absolutes and we are looking for certainty and we are looking for clear ROI and we're looking for quantitative answers, then we're going to have the forever fighting about the measurements. We're gonna be fighting about how we actually reach those answers. And my suggestion is that, uh, again, it's a policy, it's an approach answer that says an iterative approach means that the answer only needs to be relevant for now. And as soon as new information comes to light, we need to be ready to embrace that, ready to move on, ready to accept the new answer and ready to adapt whatever that means we need to do. So yeah, we're kind of chasing our tail, but that's kind of better than fighting over a disagreement. Thank you. Um, I've asked Hannah to cut off questions if your questions disappeared, sorry, because we've got about 30 to go and uh, we're already at time. So um, we'll just keep on answering them as, as long as everyone's happy to hang around and as long as you've got a bit of extra time, Brenton. Yes, okay? yeah, I do. I, I, got, I got quite a few more minutes that I can, uh, I can hang around, yeah. Wonderful, all right, let's, Whip through a few then. Um, Hugh asks, is uh, co-created value about customer needs or is it about creating needs or helping develop needs? I think it is. Uh, I think co-created value is about not only understanding what the customer's need is, but it's about helping them understand what their need is. You know, it's, it's a shared responsibility. And I think the shared responsibility element goes deeper than we've ever gone before. You know, there was a point in time when IT was just waiting for, uh, uh, you know, the, the specs. We, we just wanted the specs. Years ago, that was, that was where we started. And yeah, we'll, we'll either, we can meet them or we can't, or you know, we're a bit creative about that. And now we're saying, well, we want to understand a little bit more. Uh, to this point, we're really saying, well, co-created value means getting all the way into helping those non-technical decision makers understand what could be possible. What could we do? What, what is actually feasible and what's not? And not just to the point of, well, let's get rid of the pie in the sky, unreasonable requests, but also let's inspire what might be something awesome that, that we didn't really realize was gonna work. And that means both sides leaving a little bit of their egos behind and being willing to say, well, I don't know everything. And also willing to say, but I need to learn what you know. So, it is about customers need, but I, I think that's sort of the end game. Once you've got a clear understanding of what the need, you've actually gone through a lot to get that point. And in fact, one of the things we're gonna talk about in week three is what that's what business analysis is all about. How do you define that need in the modern era? So it's an entire profession built to answer that question. So is it fair to say business analysis is in an IT sense is about IT leadership? Uh, it, it's about defining the need. It's about defining the value. 
That's that's the simplest way I could describe okay. it. Business analysis from an IT perspective. If IT leadership is responsible for the delivering the value, business analysis is responsible for trying to quantify, identify, and de and define it so okay. that it can be delivered and measured. Beauty. Hopefully that answers your question, H. Taylor. I'm a senior business analyst slash architect. How do you view the role of enterprise or business architecture to inform IT leadership? How do you view the role of business architecture? So I would align that with business analysis in this context. I've discussed and I'm presenting business analysis as a niche. What uh, that question is about is a broader view of business architecture within business analysis as a function, the architecture of things is a relevant input. And the bigger the organization, the more specialized that's going to be. Uh, so when you have specialists that look at architecture, they are addressing uh, the big questions of the interplay. Architecture is about the interactions between, it's about the, the, the networking that's what connects to what, what flows to what, uh, what sits where, above, below, beside, et cetera. And that's an extremely important input into ultimately determining a set of needs that can then ultimately turn into a specification that we can then ultimately put a budget to and say, okay, we should do this. So I think how it informs IT leadership is by informing the way in which needs and value get defined. That would be my simplest answer. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Brent Noble is interested in your thoughts on how an organization heavily focused on engineering practices can embrace ITIL or how the two can work together effectively. Uh, and I'd say, you know, let's, let's talk about uh, all sorts of different disciplines. Some of it depends on the reason for the engineering culture or the engineering mindset. Uh, occasionally it comes from within the needs of IT like a complete lack of uh, tolerance for any kind of problems uh, in banking sector. Uh, other times it can come from previous methodologies in building things that are not necessarily needing to be hung onto. Uh, you find things uh, like in airline industries, uh, the way in which they create software uh, is not evolved. Some of them not evolving anywhere near as rapidly as you would see in other industries. Uh, should they? Well, they have some absolute cannot fail kind of outcomes from what they do in software engineering. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't go about it in a more modern way. And you've only got to look at see the, the privatization of the space race to see how some of that can be good and bad. But I think part of the answer to that question lies in figuring out what drives the engineering aspect of that because it, some of it is often quite clearly legitimate because it has requirements. And my suggestion, and again, it's simplistic, but let the engineering, what, what forces are driving the engineering mindset, let that live under the governance framework and let the day-to-day -day delivery of what goes on, what gets used and how it works live under the ITIL mindset. Let that be more flexible. Let that be more adaptive. Let that be more outcome oriented. And that can mean a split, could mean a split, or it could mean some structural change that allows the things that need to preserve their engineering approach, they're the things that fall into the categories of let's make sure of that one. And that's what governance is for. So that's kind of a, a, a quick answer to what might be an approach to that question. Okay, thanks. Ahmed asks, what are the changes between ITIL 3 and 4? You said that it was largely focused on the, on the, on the IT leadership. What we covered tonight is extremely short version, uh, but covers the paradigm shift of what ITIL 4 has added. It, 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 they've added that higher level of, you know, let's have some key concepts, you know, let's have some higher ideals that we all want to think about that's then going to shape everything else that's still there was, was there before. And we're still going to be doing all those practices, but now we're going to be doing those practices with a slightly different mindset. And that's the thing that ITIL 4 has added. Thank you. Naveen asks, how can we have a balance of information and technology? 
I've seen structures where there's either too much information ruling over technology or too much technology undermining the information, creating such, uh, not such a, a symbiotic relationship. I imagine that the, the failures and weaknesses in that are tactical. Uh, I, I suspect that a lot of that is to do with decisions that get made in, in the way that's organized and structured that are possibly not fully informed. So the sweet spot, I think, is hard to find, and it's very circumstantial. It's, it's subjective. It's going to depend on the organization. The other problem that you get is that you get sort of a subjective review of that because you get, and I, I've seen this in IT myself, you get relationships where sometimes some departments live and die by the precise nature of the information they're working with. And if there's a dot out of place, they're in a lot of trouble and other organizations that really have the tremendous flexibility or other departments, other teams, they really have a great deal of flexibility to play fast and loose with details. And so they don't have a lot of tolerance for what it takes and what the information needs to be. So even in one organization, you can have people that are answering that question two totally different ways. So in that sense, you, you, you do find places where you're never gonna get a complete answer. But the closest to the sweet spot you get goes back to where I've talked before about let's get the stakeholders involved. Those that feel the technology is too much in control and the information is suffering, let's get their input. Those that feel the reverse, let's get that. Let's find out where the aggravation points are and see if we can erode them a little bit, and build a better bridge between them. It's only going to happen when you get the competing forces a little closer together. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple I might try and link together here. Um, and it's about people that might not actually be too keen on, or not too receptive on IT leadership being in, not uh, uh, being offered to them sort of thing. The, the, the sort of co-creation, the, the reaching out to the other team. So we've got one from Jager, who is talking about the best way to get upper management who don't understand tech involved in making business decisions. And then there's Camille, who's found that the digital maturity of an organization has a massive impact on the quality or perhaps even the respect that the department is held in by other departments within an organization. Um, so yep. low maturity, messy relationships and poor end user experience and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, yeah, just I, discuss. I, I, I think uh, those points are symptoms of the fact that we're not evolving in unison. We're not evolving in harmony. What I'm talking about are the forces at work and the most mature expectations, but you definitely will find that organizations will be evolving at a different rate and bigger wheels turn more slowly. And a couple of points that were mentioned there that quite resonated with me, like the lack of respect for IT, it's, it's symbiotic, right? If we want IT to respect the value that the leverage of that service results in for somebody else, then there needs to be a reciprocal respect for IT that says, well, that's IT's problem. That's their job. They're meant to worry about that. Let's respect that fact as well. And so it kind of works both ways. And the maturity, I agree, it, it, it's meant to happen in unison, but it doesn't. Quite often, a part of the paradigm will be adopted earlier than the other one. And you might have, for example, uh, and I, I was fairly hard on the expectations of IT leadership because that's the perspective we have with this course. So I was saying, well, this is what the world is expecting of you. But what I wasn't talking about was the reciprocal flip side that says, and this is what you should get back in return. But it's true, it's, it, it's there, it's part of the machine. And the unfortunate reality is that respect isn't gonna come back to us in, in IT until the relationship exists. Because once the relationship exists, there is a second reason to pay attention for, for, for the other leadership to pay attention, to listen, to learn, and to understand. So if there's no respect or not enough respect right now, then the only reason, the only access, the only trigger we've got to pull is the money trigger. And this will cost us money. And for those individuals that are not 
willing to really broaden their mind of what IT is, does, can do, can be. The only other avenue I've seen that works is a relationship, personal relationships. This is where you find those individuals, you get them alone in a room or, or, or at a lunch counter or, or somewhere for 10 minutes and you talk about something and you bridge that knowledge gap, you bridge the unfamiliarity gap. And who else can do that but IT leadership? Really, there isn't anybody else. And it's not fair, but there's nobody else. Speaking of relationships, just I'll get rid of one here. Ibrahim Bangura has said, hi, Guy, kindly inform Brenton that I missed his voice and knowledge, hence reasons for joining this course. Thanks, Ibrahim. So Thank you, lovely. Ibrahim. Good to see you. It's always lovely I, to hear from you. I, I remember Ibrahim. Yeah. Uh, question from AJ from very early on in the piece. Uh, why, uh, why this one first? Why this webinar first? before project management BA, is there a, uh, what's your thinking behind the sequencing? Ah, right. Um, I actually thought of an answer to that question earlier today, because when I was going through the creation of this the content for tonight, I actually thought, well, hang on, I second guessed myself. And I thought, really, should I have done that? Should I have put project management first? The reason I stuck with and went with IT service management is because it's the most ubiquitous and it's the most familiar. And it's the thing that pretty much everyone in and out of IT uh, management is going to be most familiar with, involved with, understanding it's a starting point that we can most easily get our head around. And I felt that was more valuable to get that starting point and get that familiarity working for us to then say, okay, not everyone does agile. Not everyone does scrum, but we all use IT and we're all involved in delivering IT one side or the other, hence my poll. So that was the reason I felt today was an easier starting point because this is more well known. And if I was going to have the chance to throw some scary new challenging ideas at people, it's probably going to be in a space that they thought they really knew. And Brenton comes along and says, oh, well, here's something new to think about. And that was my reason for starting it that way. Thank you. Uh, Nigel asks, what do you see as the key differentiators between IT service management and enterprise service management? Governance uh, is the simplest, the simple answer. It's scale changes two big things. It, it clearly, it obviously changes the, the scale of the consequence, right? So the larger scale, when a big, when something happens in a big organization, the ripple effect can be expensive, quantitatively expensive and, and significant in other ways. So risks get compounded in big organizations. But there's a corollary to that that fundamentally changes what enterprise service management does. And that is compartmentalization of understanding. And this is where you look at value streams as part of the answer. Uh, and, and this is where the coagulation, the accumulation, the, the combining of understanding into streams of knowledge is an important approach. And enterprise service management deals with the fact that a bunch of people involved in a particular problem can only see it to the extent that their decision horizon or their information horizon can take them. They can only see to the extent that the information they have access to. What they don't see in that little bubble is that in the bubble over here, this is happening. In a bubble over there, that's happening. And in a bubble over here, this is happening. And when you add all those five bubbles and what each one is costing us, it will be much cheaper to go about this whole thing differently. And that's the, the extra layer that enterprise service management has to deal with. It has to have that, you know, because at that scale, that happens. If you've got a small IT department, you don't get those. First of all, you don't get the the silos because the people are more freely more regularly interacting with each other but that to me is what makes governance so much more important to the enterprise than it is to the ordinary business the medium enterprise thanks a lot uh b Klobots, i'm sorry i've just dismissed your two questions there was about 15 questions in there two very interesting essays brenton but i don't think we'll, we'll be able to get to them all uh, i want to okay. just finish with two more questions 
Angela asks, how important is a service management tool and a service catalog for successful delivery of ITSM? Hello, Angela. Uh, you, you told me you were coming along tonight. Um, how important is a service management tool and a catalog? The simple short answer is, well, it, it helps you not miss something. I think what I said before about leadership making decisions, you, you have to make a lot of decisions about things. And when you have tools like catalogs, when you have something that is meant to be exhaustive, what it can help you do is make sure that you make all the decisions about all of the things that need the decisions. So that's one simple answer that comes from the IT leadership perspective. There's also a bunch of other influences that something like a, a service catalog can do for the co-creation discussions. Because service catalogs are a way of providing an alignment of understanding. Because if you look at what services is and what services are and what they do and the details that you, you'll find an IT department will have a different set of knowledge uh, or a different perspective or a different awareness of what a service is, does, has compared to the customers that use that. But when you have service catalog, there's always a portion of the service catalog that is meant to be visible to the customer. It is, it is meant to align what the customer sees and has. And that can be an excellent trigger starting place, a point for alignment to commence when it comes to let's have a co-creation discussion. Let's have an iterative feedback discussion. Let's have a discussion about How's that service working out for you? What service? Well, what does it do? Well, it, we have a starting point for that conversation. And I think from an IT leadership, that's another very useful thing. Apart from the fact that, you know, there's a record keeping benefit out of it. What's the point of the record keeping? That's the, that's the answer I tried to give. Thanks a lot. Uh, final question in Umbao. Uh, what do you want us to take or learn from this topic? What value is it for our tomorrow? Uh, and I thought that might be a nice segue to your your conclusion slide, which perhaps with retrospect, I should have let you go first with <laughs> um, for those listening along because a couple of hundred people have had to leave in the half hour. But thanks for sticking around, everyone. And thanks for answering all these questions, Brenton. It's been thanks, huge. Right. My closing slide. It was a perfect segue. Thank you for the question. I use this analogy to try and change the mindset, right? IT service management, uh, we talked about co-created value and, and what does it all mean? I'm gonna give you an analogy. This is what this analogy is. When we go to a hospital or medical clinic, when we go seeking medical care, what are we focused on? What are we as the customer focused on? What do we hope that every single person we interact with in that medical environment, what do we hope they are focused on? It's the medical outcomes the health of the patient, the prognosis. That's what we're focused on. And we're a lot less focused on the, the tech, the equipment. What brand of ultrasound are they using? Are you, you know, is the syringe out of date? Well, maybe some of the things we worry about, but generally those specifics, <laughs> the, the training, the, the precise procedure, you know, do they do this first or that first? What we really hope they're focused on is, well, what's the best result? What's the best outcome? Do I just follow the procedure and hope that delivers the result? Or do I focus on the result and the outcome and let other things service that? And that's the mindset that we are seeing evolve within IT. And you go a step further and you say, well, yeah, okay, I can understand why that happens in medicine because the result is health or non-health. Pretty serious, right? Pretty, pretty big result. Well, the exact same analogy can be brought about with the health of the business, the enterprise, the organization. It's the same idea. It's the health of that entity that is either up or down trajectory based on whether or not we are focused on the value delivery of IT services. And what's been going on for years is that we've been awfully good at ignoring the pain and not either not thinking we can do much about it, not knowing how we could do much about it, uh, and not knowing how to empower IT, not knowing how to empower the customer, not, not knowing how to create a new paradigm. Now we're starting to see some ideas as to how it might work. Getting a lot of love for the example. 
uh, in the chat. Um, so excellent. Mm. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad a few people have, have found that helpful and resonating. Yeah, uh, it's a confronting example because mm. we always take medicine seriously, right? It's it, there's there's nothing nothing relaxed about it. Nothing we just like put up with. It's it's always something that we're gonna strive for. We're gonna invest in it. Often over invest in it. Uh, so it, it's it, it's confronting sometimes to think is that really a fair analogy? Well, I think there's some value in it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, uh, that brings us to a close of the first topic. Uh, if you're keen on that, even if you've enjoyed it so far, well, first of all, stick around for the last few webinars. Um, free short courses, my very favorite thing about IT Masters and the greatest excuse I have to chat with Brenton and shout at 700 people at once about netball. Um, I've just sent a, a, a link into the chat uh, you can find all of the other free short courses we have there, including those listed on the slide. Um, from that page or any of the pages that Hannah's no doubt linked to, you can also find our postgrad courses, the ones that are relevant to this short course, although I think the this webinar has you know, sort of suggested that it's relevant to all areas of IT. Um, and then down the right, there's a, a series of subjects that you'll find in, in the courses that are listed on the left there. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and um, make a video about some of your, your postgrad study options out of this short course and how the short course might help uh, on the course page. I'll not do a, a big old marketing spiel just because I'm terrible at it without waffling, as you might expect. <laughs> and, um, and as Brenton sort of discussing with me before the webinar, maybe the, the, the messaging and the, and the paradigm needs to shift. Um, uh, so so I'll, I'll try and tailor that to this cohort soon. I guess um, we should tell them what's next, right? Finally, yeah, we've, we've um, <laughs> uh, yeah, just a big uh, red dot for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, just a reminder of uh, how to make sure that you get, for those of you who are looking to get credit for completion of this particular short course, uh, there's a few steps they've got to do. And this isn't the only one. What, what do they have to do, Guy? Well, every webinar, and module every webinar, every webinar is part of a module every module has a little quiz sort of five questions that brenton puts together and you need to uh, complete all of those quizzes to unlock the exam and uh, they're all very simple multi-choice quizzes also and if you, you want to get the maximum out of the marks um, you'll need to post in the forums each week about some of the content provided um, there'll be some prompts we'll provide there'll be prompts that people who have been listing along will provide just just get in there and that's where a lot of the value comes from in these short courses there's some fantastic discussions in some of the other short courses and then we we'll, have to we'll do it within the study window to get the yeah, partial credit right that's that's right the the exam is available forevermore um, because you know if people didn't know about this short course they shouldn't be punished for it um, particularly when it comes to credit but um if you we, we just sort of really value the the live interaction with these short courses. So anyone that jumps in, we sort of give some bonus points to. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll go over okay. all of the exam settings a bit later. But um, next week, Brenton, we're, we're talking about project management. We are? IT project management. So yes, you know, the agile, scrummish, safe-ish stuff. Yeah, looking forward to it. Mm. All right, well, well, thanks heaps, Hannah, for all of the questions you answered today uh, and all of the chat moderation. Thanks everyone for hanging around and Brenton, thank you so much. I'll, I'll leave it to you to sign off again. Thank you guy. Uh, and thank you, Hannah and, uh, and the others behind the scenes that helped bring this along tonight. This is only the one of four. Uh, it is more holistic than many of our other short courses have been before. So I do hope many of you can stick with it. Uh, join in till the end. Great to have all the input, the questions, terrific, etc., and, I definitely look forward to hearing from you all again next week. Until then, that's all from me for now. Thank you and good night.